and they pushed him from judgment to judgment he will come here talk he kept quiet and they took him and they nailed him he became the stubborn the rebellious the gluten, the drunkard, the liar, the fornicator, the adulterer that cannot be tamed. And at Calvary, my master Jesus, who knew no sin, he became helpless sinner. And they pushed him. From judgment to judgment, he will come here, talk. He kept quiet. And they took him and they nailed him. He became the stubborn, the rebellious, the gluten, the drunkard. The liar, the fornicator, the adulterer that cannot be tamed. And at Calvary, my master Jesus, who knew no sin, he became helpless sinner. Uh, good day. Uh, a few weeks ago, I made a, a small video on the teachings of uh, uh, one of the respected men of God in Nigeria, uh, men of God, uh, by the name of uh, Bile Akani, uh, and quite a few people, including people that actually uh, visit uh, both my blog and the YouTube channel uh, quite often. Uh, they took exception to the idea of uh, lumping Mr. Akani with uh, other first teachers of Nigeria. Uh, some of them took very strong exceptions to the idea that uh, if we are talking of false teachers in Nigeria, then uh, Mr. Kani uh, has presented himself in his ministry in such a way that uh, the only option that we have is to exclude him from the list of, uh, of false teachers in Nigeria. In the particular video, uh, in case you have not seen the, watch the video, I will advise you that you go and watch it. One major point that I made, which is indisputable, there's no way you can dispute with the point, is that Mr. Akani uh, is a Pentecostal. He's somebody who believes in the uh, experiences of Pentecostalism. He he sounds quite uh, gentle and uh, at times you might even think that he sounds sincere but one thing that you cannot take away from him is that he's a Pentecostal he believes in the teachings that originated from Azusa Street in 1906 1901 to 1913 and one of the fundamental issues that I'm bringing to the attention of every human being is that what happened in Azusa Street in 1906 to 1913 is actually from Satan. That is the fundamental statement that I'm making. Um, that is the fundamental statement that I'm making. That 
Pentecostalism is ab initio a satanic thing. It's not Christian. That is actually the fundamental statement that I'm making. And if if you are really concerned about the God of the universe, about the God of the Bible, about the Lord Jesus Christ, you must uh, pay attention to the issues that I'm raising for the attention of everybody. The issues that I'm throwing up in the teachings of Pentecostals, Charismatics, Word of Faith, New Apostolic Reformation people. I want to say it again. Uh, it's, it's something that is worth saying for, for 100 million hours. If we say anything else, but we say that, we repeat it, that Pentecostalism is ab initio and from the beginning and in totality a product of satanism. Please, you must listen very carefully. Let me tell you the risk I'm running if you know your Bible at all. The risk I'm running is that I'm running the risk of hell if you know your Bible. If Pentecostalism is from the Spirit of God, by me calling it a work of Satan, I'm actually therefore telling you that the work of the Holy Spirit is a work of Satan. That is what I'm telling you. That is what the Bible says. If Pentecostalism is actually a work of the Spirit of God, and somebody like me can sit down here and tell you, no, you only need to open your eyes. It's a work of the spirit of Satan. If I'm wrong, I'm running the risk of hell. I don't know the Bible much. But you will not stay. You will not stay 30 minutes on my blog. Before you know that it's very likely I know what I'm talking about. I want to tell you that I know what I'm talking about. I, I want to tell you that I know what I'm talking about. And the challenge I give to everybody is to simply pick the Bible and slow down both my video and the teachings of everyone that I call out. Slow both of them down and check them with the Bible. The way God asks people to check his words. Pick a good Bible. Generally, I do recommend the King James Version and uh, ESV. Generally, I do not recommend more than those two. Pick both Bible. And if you get the old Yoruba Bible, the old Yoruba Bible, pick that Bible and check what Mr. Akane is teaching. What David Yodepo is teaching. What Inokadeboye is teaching. What Mr. Kumuyi is teaching. What the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, the NAR people, the, the Apostle, Apostle Reformation people, the Copelands, the Benihins, and their children all over Nigeria and all over Africa, all over the world, check what they are teaching with what is written in the Bible. And you see whether of a truth the world is not running under a massive deception. The sort of deception the world has never seen for, more for, for virtually 2,000 years. My job is to sound the alarm. Sound it as loud and as clear as possible. Everybody has a choice. If you think you have a choice, I can tell you nobody really has a choice. But God is giving each person the opportunity to check out his word. 
to check out is what stop regarding yourself as a baby that anybody will take by the nose and guide you on the word of god everybody can read the word of god and if you pray to the lord jesus christ to teach you the real meaning of what you are reading he will teach you i'm telling you something you are not going to have an excuse the day you have been thrown to hell it's as simple as that you are not going to have an excuse if you refuse to check the word of god against what i'm saying against what mr adepoye is saying against what mr akani is saying against what what uh, kumuyi is saying against what if any human being on earth is saying if you do not check god's word to be sure that nobody is taking you for a ride nobody is leading you through the garden path nobody is deceiving you you will have no other person but yourself to blame when sadly at the end of your life you are thrown into hell let me repeat the statement i've just made i made earlier and that is that just according to what the lord jesus christ prophesied when he was around here on earth the devil is fully and totally in control of the churches the devil is fully and totally in control of the churches he has his preachers his bishops his apostles his evangelists to teach you evil to substitute the teachings of demon for the teachings of the bible we will examine what mr akane says what he teaches in this particular instance we will examine what he teaches the video might not be long it might be but because of the issue that i'm dealing with if you know the value if you know what happens if you know the truth that human beings we do not perish we die the moment is the moment a soul is created it lives for all eternity either before god in heaven or with the devil in hell the devil is a, is appealing to every one of you to come and live with him in hell god has made the bible available for us to know him to check so that we might know him so that we might run to him it's important if you think you are actually somebody who is seeking after god with mr akani it's important that you check what is teaching against the teachings inside the bible because mr akani in believing in pentecostalism is actually teaching doctrines of demons even though he is doing it with style he do, is doing it with humility as great as the blood provision is are you hearing me god did not stop there as great as the blood profession is god did not stop there uh what mr akane is saying is that uh, there's something uh, greater than the blood profession in the bible i'm not going to talk too much on that i'm only going to draw your attention uh, to the fact that according to the bible blood represents life that is the that is what you have in the bible and this video when it is produced you are going to see you are going to read it that as far as uh, as far as far as god is uh, as far as god is concerned when god speaks about the blood 
particularly the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is actually talking about is life. That is what God is talking about. So, once you get that, you begin to quickly grasp what Mr. Akane is saying. That there is something greater than the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in Christianity. And that is what he will teach us in this uh, short uh, message. So let's listen. So something that is greater than the blood of Christ in Christianity. Hallelujah. Now there are few analogies in the Bible that we must talk together about. Yeah, Mr. Akane will, he will tell us some few analogies in the Bible. Uh, what the hint I can give you is that the analogies are basically about uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you could see, as I wrote there, we are interested. We must be interested in in Mr. Akani's analogies since they relate to since they relate to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian should be uh, should be interested in what analogies that Mr. Akani has for us. The reason is because. When Jesus Christ was introducing the concept of the cross from John chapter 3 so that you will know that the cross actually was a mystery that was already planned from before the foundation of the earth even before Jesus came on earth the mystery of the cross was already established. Okay. The concept and the mystery of the cross. Okay, let's listen. So, right in John chapter 3, he was pointing to Nicodemus that, look, oh, these things cannot be. Unless, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up the word must makes the cross an indispensable aspect of our deliverance okay yeah we we should pay attention to to where mr akane is going how he interprets the, the cross and in what particular way the cross according to him is an indispensable aspect of our deliverance we should listen to we should listen carefully to what mr akane has to tell us can we quickly point at few passages that is pointing at the cross and then let's see sure we should. We should look at the passages that point at the cross in the Bible. Th that's very vital. That's very important to us. We should look at those passages and check whether, whether what the passages teach are the same things that Mr. Akane is teaching us. We should look at those passages. Now, apart from John 3, where the Son of Man identified directly with the serpent that was hanging on the tree. And in my mind, I'm saying, how can the Son of Man, eh? how can he be likened to the serpent on the tree? Mr. Akane is using a language which we must quickly decode. Uh, it's going to give us his meaning, but for the sake of everyone that will be watching this video, we, we must quickly talk about what he's talking about. That the Bible said that Christ identified 
with the serpent. By using the language identify with what Mr. Akani is saying, which is going to confirm, is that Christ became the serpent. That is what, that actually what he's saying. If you know anything about the Bible, that should start ringing an alarm in your mind. I'm not taking Mr. Akani out of his own words. I'm only drawing your attention to the fact that his language of Christ identified with what he's actually saying is that is that which is which you are going to hear from his mouth directly is that there was a time Christ was indeed the serpent on the cross that is what Mr. Akane is saying you better listen very carefully there's a passage of the Bible which I'm going to paste on this particular spot and it is in John chapter 3 verse 14 to verse 15 that is where the Bible speaks in the same area of sentence between Christ and the serpent and you should note exactly what the Bible says that Christ will be an object of focus for salvation the same way the serpent was an object was the object of focus for healing in the wilderness this is a very important part of the bible and this is a very important part of the cult of the pentecostal satanic cult which they are teaching and you must please this i, I do not deal in frivol frivolities in case you do not know that i deal in something that you are going to regret for all of eternity if you are, if you don't pay attention I deal in something that you are going to be grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ that he sent a stammerer like me to you to wake you up if you listen, if you pay attention. What the Bible says, which Mr. Akani is twisting, is that Christ was going to be hung on the tree and you are to look at him and leave everyone that looks at him on the tree lives the same way they lived when they look at the serpent in the olden days the bible never teaches the stretch and and it's an important stretch that Mr. Akani is, is, is applying to that part of the Bible. The Bible never teaches that Christ was transposing into a serpent. The Bible is presenting Christ to you as the solution, as the person you look at on the cross. To live for all of eternity but mr akani is twisting it and if you do not get the difference between what he is saying and what the bible is saying you are playing with your own eternity how can he who knew no sin now be treated like serpent on the tree so that he may shed his blood for us so that it might, it might deliver us from sin and its consequences. Sin. Sin and its consequences. So that it might bring us back to God. That question, I want you to keep it at the back of your mind. There are questions that we have to answer. Absolutely. 
we must keep the question at the back of our hands. As you can see that I wrote on the screen, it, one can only hope that Mr. Akani is paying attention to what he's saying. Face -face, what is written on the pages of the Bible itself. If you do not know what is written on, the, on, written on the pages of the Bible, it is very easy to bring ideas developed in the occult. And superimpose them on what is written in the book of Christianity and start calling it Christianity. What we transpose that the Son of Man that God has testified about, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. What we make him also to transpose to become what? Like serpent. Did you hear what uh, Mr. Akani just said? Did you really pay attention to what he had just said? That Christ transposed to become like serpent. Did you did you really get that? Did you really get what Mr. Akani had just said? If, if it were if it were a mistake, if it were a mistake, you might say, okay, well maybe maybe it's a slip of the tongue. No, but it's not a, it's not a slip of the tongue. Mr. Akani is saying that Christ had transposed to become like serpent. You must listen very carefully for the sake of your own soul, for the sake of your own eternity. Billy Akani saying that Christ had transposed to become like serpent is not a slip of the tongue. It's a fundamental aspect of the teaching of the occult that the Pentecostals imbibed from Azusa Street. That big grammar, simply translated, means that Christ had become serpent. That is what Billy Akani teaches. That is what his mouth is saying. The Holy One of Israel was now as Billy Akane called him later in the video embodiment of sin you see let me give you this before we move far because what I'm dealing with is very important we are not just trying to win an argument I'm trying to tell you the teaching the basic teaching of the Bible and the basic teaching of the Bible is that the lamb that will be used for sacrifice as payment for sin must be holy. That the lamb is holy the moment it is dedicated. The lamb itself, the lamb itself becomes holy the moment it is dedicated. That is the teaching of the Bible. The lamb itself is imputed the sin of the people. But the lamb itself is not sinful. Mr. Akani does not understand the basic teaching of the God of the Bible that the lamb that will be used for payment for sin must be blameless and is sinless. It's only the career of sin of the people by imputation. Not that it is sinful. 
Billy Akani is teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ became sinful. What the Bible teaches is that God imputes on him the sin of us all. Please, this is a very, very important issue. If you do not understand what we are talking about, you do not understand the Christianity, you do not understand the God of the Bible. The Bible never teaches that the Lamb, the Lamb becomes sinful. The Bible teaches that the Lamb becomes the carrier of the sin. The sinless Lamb becomes the carrier. The God inputs on him, on the Lamb, the sin of the sinners. Therefore, calling the lamb sinful, you are actually saying the opposite. Because in that, what actually happens is that the lamb becomes holy. The moment that lamb is dedicated to carry the sin of the people, the lamb becomes holy from that moment. If the lamb is sacrificed, only holy people can eat it. Only holy people can touch it. Once it is dedicated to God for that purpose. Let's listen. You are going to hear this thing from Mr. Akani's mouth. And what Mr. Akani is teaching are doctrines of demons. It's only a demon that we call the Lord Jesus Christ sinful. It's only from demons that you get the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ transposed into a serpent. It's only in the shrine. It's only in, it's, it's only in Kovun that you that you hear that. Many a times when I say this thing, they say, "Yeah, because uh, because you are you are a witch yourself." Let me tell you, yes, I am. Yes, I know what they do there. And I can tell you categorically, only in the covens that they call Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, a serpent. Now, when you go to Galatians, let's go to Galatians quickly. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from what from the cause of the law having become what has he become a cause for us for it is written cost is everyone who hangs on a tree so the first question you should be asking quickly is where was it written eh? where was it written and if it was written in the Old Testament, are you, are you ready for us to study now? Yes. Where was that scripture written? Yeah, as you can see that I wrote there. Where it is written is surely important. We should check. We should check where it is written in the Bible. So, uh, that is actually the major problem of most people that follow these people. Most people that go to church today, they, they wait for their pastors to read for them and to regurgitate, to spew out whatever colored information, colored beliefs, whatever distorted beliefs, he had imbibed. Instead of opening the Bible to read exactly what is written there, reading verses before, verses after, in order to understand what God is saying in the particular passage of the Bible.
They do not read the Bible themselves. So, we must pay attention so that we see exactly where, where it is written in the Bible. It is when we pay attention, when we see what, where it is written in the Bible and what is written there. That is the only place, that is the only way for us to, to see the twisting that Mr. Akani is making with the word of God. So we should pay attention. Let's see where it is written. Let's take it. Deuteronomy what? 21. Thank you. Thank you. Let's quickly go to Deuteronomy 21. I think the story will be better from verse 18. Yeah. Where was the scripture written? Where? Let us check it up. Let's see it. If a man, verse 18, are you in verse 18? Has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who when they have chastened him will not heed them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him. Okay. Deuteronomy 21 uh, from verse 18. Uh, Deuteronomy 21 from verse 18. Uh, you, you, are not, you are not going to be told. The place. I am going to make sure you actually see it. You are going to read what is there. Yourself. So, we go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. We read from verse 18. Following Mr. Akani. And bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. This passage that uh, Mr. Akane is reading here, uh, I must remind you, uh, according to him, is a reference uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage, according to Mr. Akane, refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those adjectives that you just heard from his mouth, stubborn, Rebellious, glutton, they apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, he is, is to be put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight. Did you follow that now? Now, let's relax with me. Why are we returning to this passage? That was what the New Testament was based upon. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, if a man, not if a son, get stubborn, rebellious, Glutonous. The, the Bible makes a difference. But Mr. Akani is combining all of them together in order to put to, to prove a point. And we must listen to the point he's setting out to prove. And uh, even though it is clear to any ordinary reader of the Bible that God, the story about the rebellious son and his punishment ended in verse 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 21. Mr. Akani, as if 
is reading the Bible for the first time. As if he's a primary one reader of an English literature. He's pretending as if he does not see that God's prescription on what to do with any man hanged on the tree is connected to what you have in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21 from verse 18. Verse 22 and verse 23 for almost 50 years that I've been reading it has always been distinct from verse 18 to verse 21. Except the occult people, nobody has connected except the occult people, nobody has connected the rebellious son with what you have in verse 22 and verse 23. You, you should read what you have in your Bible. The Bible starts from in verse 22 with and and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death this is just any man. This is not a rebellious son. Any, any man, any criminal anybody that they want to execute the major way of execution in Israel is by stoning but if generally speaking in the society this is a total stranger because Mr. Akane is looking to fish out what you have in yellow in, in verse 23 for he that is hanged is accursed of God. He simply lumped verse 22 and verse 23 with the story of a rebellious son. And therefore he has, he has created a grotesque evil being as his Christ. But let's, let's listen to him. Let's listen to him create his own Bible. So actually when they were deciding that they will hang, they will crucify Jesus, they had sat according to their law. Yeah, what, what law is that? What law is that? Mr. Akane? And they had concluded that Jesus Hey, are you listening to me now? That Jesus fitted this kind of offense in Deuteronomy 21. Are you listening to Mr. Akani? Are you paying attention to what he's saying? <laughs> that some group had decided that Jesus was a perfect fit for the offenses in Deuteronomy chapter 21 that Jesus was an incorrigible glutton stubborn a rebel I, I hope you are paying attention to what he's saying that in actual fact, there were valid accusations against Jesus. Let's listen to Mr. Akane. Let me tell you that the Pharisees were not arbitrary when they decided that they should crucify him. It has taken only... 2,000 years. We now have uh, 
we now have reasons why Christ must be killed. We now have a valid reason. Just a third above 2,000 years to get the reason. But here we are. From the mouth of supposed follower of Christ, we now have a reason why Christ should have been crucified. They were acting on what? On their law. They were? That is serious. That's serious. There were actually laws, according to Mr. Akane, that Christ violated. Christ was not sinless. There were, there were laws that people could see that Christ had violated. And those laws, those crimes, could be seen in Deuteronomy chapter 21, according to our teacher. Now you will listen, and we are going to look at that. Now what is the condition for a person to be qualified to this kind of treatment? They gave us a case. Yeah, we are listening. We are listening. What is the case? He said, if a man, if a, if a man, a man and his wife has a son, that is what? Stubborn, rebellious, untamable. You've done all you know how to do to him, and there's no way you have disciplined him, you chastised him, and he can't change. To the extent that the father and the mother have decided that it was better not to have a child than to keep this boy alive. You must be reminded again that the analogy and the allegory that Mr. Akani is drawing here is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Akani is not speaking in a vacuum. He's not just telling tales. He's teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's using Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to verse 21, to teach about Christ. The stubborn, the rebellious, the gluttonous, the drunkard son. So, his father and his mother, according to Mr. Akani, were fed up with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were the ones that brought him to the scribes and to the Pharisees to punish as laid down by the law. That is what Mr. Akane said. And that is what those people sitting in front of him laughing, that is what they are accepting. That the passage can be applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man has come to a position where his father and his mother they have come to conclude that the answer to this problem is to finish with him but again in the law they cannot kill him by themselves what would they do now the best they would do lay hold of him and they say, well, we have done our best on you. We have tried to correct you. We have tried to make you do things. We have tried to do this, but you cannot change. We are finished with you. We don't need you again in our house. And so they came and grabbed him like this. 
they grab him like this at that time he may be begging am i right at that time he may be begging i will change i will not do that again oh don't take me to the others don't take me to the others he said no this is how we have kept you for all our years you cannot change you are untamable and they drag him and as they were dragging him they drag him and they came to the elders of the city and then they stood there with their son you know the elders normally sit at the gate eh? they said yes sir say yes uh, this is our son I want you to know the way they are talking they say they didn't say this boy mm -mm -mm -mm. what did they say this our son is our own by that we identify with him he's our own we gave back to him we did not adopt him he's our own please listen i'm being very uh, meticulous here because it's important that was christ that his father held in his hand before the elders of his city to be punished. That is what Mr. Akane is saying. You, you need to watch this video. Watch it to the end. I don't know when it's going to end. You need to watch it to the end. So that you get the full picture that Mr. Akane is painting. So that you might compare the picture Mr. Akane is painting. With whatever little knowledge you are able to retain from your Bible studies class when you were in primary school. I'm assuming you have never you've never opened the Bible since the moment you left primary, primary school. It's important that you pay attention. If you do not pay attention, when people like me stand up to say, watch it, Watch it. Billy Akane is not a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will generally appeal to his humility. Oh, the man is very humble. Oh, the man is very sincere. Oh, the man has integrity. We are not discussing that. We are not discussing any of those three or more qualities. We are discussing whether the man is truthful to the Bible. Whether he's comparing like with like. Whether he's combining like with like. Whether he's actually truthfully dissecting the word of God. Or whether he's coming from another place far darker than the typical eye can see. That is what that is what this is about. So according to him, the picture you are watching is that of Christ being led by his father to the elders at the gate to be punished this is our son sir is stubborn is rebellious as you see him like this since we gave back to him <laughs> we have done all we can do all the rules and regulations we know to help a boy we did we fasted and we prayed no way we chastised him 
No way. And we have come to conclude that he is better dead than alive. Please. Now, do you think he will keep quiet? He will say, no, daddy, I will not do that again. No. Even if you will not do that again, when you have finished with the elders, you will know what to do. <laughs> And then they handed him over. Christ, the stubborn son, was handed over by his father, his physical father, by Joseph. Now, there are two ways by which he could have been dealt with. The first way was to get all the people of the city to start doing what? Stoning him. Stoning him. Stoning him. Stoning him. Stoning him. You know it's not the first stone that will kill him. It's not the first ten stones that may kill him. As they are stoning him, he will say, yeah, oh, yeah, ah, yeah. The, the Bible twisting intensifies. Mr. Akani is telling us that there are two ways. The rebellious son could have been dealt with. As you can see, I wrote there, it's always good that you should read your Bible. Read what is written there to see whether there is one way or there are two ways. But Mr. Akani has produced two ways for this rebellious son to be dealt with so as to bring extraneous issues things that are not written in the bible so as to bring them into it so as to introduce things that are not there in the bible into it read the bible open the bible and read it yourself So that you might see that Mr. Akane is not being truthful to the text. He's introducing his own opinions, his own ideas, sourced not from the text, but from somewhere else. You know, occasionally, as they begin to stone him, and the students say, hey, oh, mommy, daddy, please, you are the only one who can rescue me, please. It's possible that the parents comes back and say, uh, excuse me, he has never cried like this <laughs> since we delivered him. Uh, 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 can you let us have him back? And the other say, well, he was in your house before you brought him. We did not compel you to bring him. If you are no more ready to release him, you still want to carry him back to your house. All well and good. And then so they take him back. Yeah, conjectures. Uh, you, you now have, uh, at least you, as you could hear, you could see that Mr. Akane is now introducing his own, he's writing fiction now. As you can see, it's not writing fiction and it's transposing fiction into the Bible. So you now have the story of uh, of the half dead son being carried back home by his father. And as they take him back, he settles down maybe for three or four days or one week <laughs> and he becomes a bit gentle and he comes up again. It, it comes again. It's terrible again. Ah, they grab him back. <laughs> this time, we are finished. Sir. Don't look at his tears. Don't look at his cry. He cannot change. We are going. And so they leave him 
where they will not hear his cry. And then the men of the city, and I said, what to do with this boy is to hang him on the tree. They have killed incorrigible Christ being taken back to the elders of the city at the gate by his father to be killed. The question that I'm trying to ask you is this. When they were to crucify Jesus, that was the passage that was their foundational passage for doing it. Did you hear that again? Did you, did you get it therefore that Mr. Kane is, uh, is persistent? Uh, what you heard from his mouth at the beginning of the of the video uh, is not a slip of the tongue. It's persistent in saying what he's saying. Christ violated no rules, and the rules are in Deuteronomy chapter twenty-one. Verse 18 to verse 21. And his punishment, therefore, was in line with the stipulations in the rules. Question now is this How did Jesus, who knew no sin, and who, right from the very beginning of his life, at the baptism of John, heaven declare, is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, six days, or let's say one or two weeks, unto the cross, God again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, again confirmed, this is my well beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. How did he who knew no sin, become a stubborn, a rebellious, a glutinous, incorrigible son that has to be handed over at the gate. What happened? Did you hear the, the persistent characterization of evil on the part of the Son of God by Mr. Biliakani. Did you did you hear what Mr. Biliakani is saying consistently and persistently about the Son of God? Let me repeat what I've said before in this video. Maybe, maybe not even in this video. You don't have many more dangerous people on earth than people who step forward to say that they have words for you from God. Did you hear what I just said? You do not have many more dangerous people you are going to meet with for all the length of your stay on earth than the people who step forward to say that they have word for you from God. God recognized that fact. The Lord Jesus Christ won so many times against letting down your guards. Christ warned that you must take note and be careful so that, so that you are not deceived. You, 
you can simply close down this video and read Matthew chapter 24. Just read that chapter alone. And you see the number of times, the recurrence, the, the recurrence of the warnings of the Lord Jesus Christ against deception. And I just hope that you will have some regard for the words of Christ because he warned that you, should, you must be careful. You must watch out for, for deception. Satanic deception will not come the way people think they come. They will come dress up in cassocks. When all your guards are let down, The day I start telling you that you should take me serious, you, you should take my words for it without checking the Bible, that is the day you, you must flee from me. Because the issue is not me. The issue is the word of God. So if you allow anybody to hoodwink you that he is a holy man, and you can take his words for it without checking the words against the Bible. You know what we are doing? You are actually offending God. The God that called the people of Berea in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, noble. The God that calls the people of Berea noble for checking out the words coming out of the mouth of Apostle Paul. Is the one you offend when you take Mr. Gwilea Kane's words for it. God is the one you offend when you take Kumuyi's word for it. God is the one you offend when you take Adeboye's words for it. Talk less of a total, totally satanic people in Winners Chapel. When you take their words for it, what you are supposed to do is to check the Bible and see whether what they are saying you are lying. I'm guaranteeing you something. If you have waited on this video to this time, I'm guaranteeing you something. And that is that the words coming out of the mouth of every one of these people, the moment you start to put them side by side with the word of God, you discover distortion, you discover twisting. And you must now, therefore, ask yourself the question, who their Lord is, who is the one sending them errand to come out to twist the Bible? What agenda they are actually following? Whose agenda they are prosecuting? Now, it appears to me there is a mystery. The cross. So the Lord Jesus, and this is important, I want you to please follow this very simply and closely because I pray that God will help us here. It appears as if there is one stubborn son untamable no matter what you do it cannot change even if you chastise it it cannot be corrected that is in our hands eh? that needed to be taken to the elders at the gate it appears to him it appears to him there is an incorrigible stubborn son and that son is in the Lord Jesus Christ not what you can see in the Bible but what apparently appears to Mr. Bileakani 
when I tell the people, when I tell people that Mr. Aguilera can he consider the Bible incomplete, inadequate, those who don't understand what the Bible teaches, they fight against my statement because they don't pay attention to what comes out from the mouth of Mr. Akani. It appears to him that there's something incorrigible, stubborn, glutinous in the rest of us, and that thing was in Christ too. And according to Mr. Billy Akani, that was what Christ must take to the cross. That was why Christ must go to the cross. That is what Mr. Billy Akani teaches. And you are telling yourself that Mr. Billy Akani is not writing his own Bible. Now listen to me. And it appears John the Baptist says something at the baptism of Jesus the second day when he saw Jesus walking. Do you remember John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Who taketh away the sins of the whole world. Now, there was no explanation in that chapter. There was no explanation in that chapter because none was ever needed. Because both the John the Baptist and his audience, they were aware of what the Lamb of God was supposed to signify. They were aware of what the Lamb itself alone, the Lamb, was supposed to mean in the faith of their forefathers. There was no explanation. But as, I, as I've always advised, we need to pay atten attention to what Mr. Akane has for us as his own explanation. John the Baptist and his audience were aware of the teachings of their Bible. In the book of Lepticus, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, of what the Lamb was supposed to signify. But Mr. Akani has something for us, something so important that we must hear it from his mouth. What happened? Why didn't heaven stand up to say, No! You can't treat him like this. What happened? Why didn't heaven stand up to say that Christ was being called the Lamb of God? Why didn't heaven stand up to protest that Christ was being called the Lamb of God? What took place is the critical question that I'm, right, I'm really praying that we can deal with. Can we go a bit further? Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we sure must deal with what took place in Christ. What must have taken place in the in the Savior? As you can see that Mr. Akani is drawing particular attention to the importance of what according to him took place, then, then we, we need to really listen to him so that we know exactly what is what his theology is teaching us about what took place in Christ. Now, the Bible said, and I want us to read what the Bible said now. We will read it from different passages, but we're hoping that God will help us. I want someone to 
to read a graphic passage for us from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 21. 21, please. Who can read 21 for us, either from the old King James? He had made him to be seen for us. Who knew no sin? Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, thank you. Now, NIV. God made him who had no sin to be seen. God us. made him who had no sin. You see, the, the way the language is coming is quite very strong. God made him who had no sin to be what? What's the meaning of that? Yes. Yes. What is the meaning of that? What, is, what does the Bible actually mean by saying that God made Christ who never sinned to be seen for us? What does the Bible what does the Bible mean by that? In what way was Christ made to be seen for us even though he never sinned? The best thing is to open the Bible itself. And as I've always warned, this is a very important juncture of this video. Virtually every part of this video is very is important, but this is a little much more important that you should get what Mr. Akane is teaching. Because what you are going to have in the next few minutes is actually the kernel of the teaching of Pentecostalism. What we are going to have in the next few minutes is the difference between biblical Christianity and Pentecostalism. It can be heavier than that. What does the Bible mean by saying that God made Christ to be seen for us even though he had no sin? One of the best places to start is to start from the book of Exodus. That's just one of the best places to start. And I will advise you to read the book of Exodus. Do not rush over anything. The Bible is a life and death book. The ideas the Bible discusses, they are so important that Whoever, as, I've, as I've said so many times in this video and so many times over the various videos that I've published, the ideas are such that you must never allow anybody to rush you over particularly those very important ones. Because Christ actually said that where you spend eternity depends on what you think about him while you are alive. That is what Christ himself said. That where you spend your eternity depends on what you believe about Christ. This is one of those places that we must dwell a little. What does the Bible mean by saying God made Christ to become sin for us? even though Christ knew no sin. When you read Exodus 12, verse 1 to 13, you see the idea of the Lamb of God there. The idea of the Lamb. You see the idea of the blood of the innocent Lamb being what stands between men and death. You see that there. And that idea never changed. 
throughout the Bible. When you read the book of Le Leviticus, the book, the book of Le Leviticus has a lot to say about the teaching on sin and sin offering. And therefore, as we go on, we will open, we will check again. Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. So many chapters in the book of Lef Leviticus. They talk about how you get your sins covered. How you get God to pardon you of your sins. And none of them really happens without an innocent paying with his blood for you. In Exodus and the book of Leviticus, the innocent were generally animals. The innocent were the animals that are standing for you. And what the Bible teaches, as I said earlier, is that your, your, your sins are transferred, so to speak, onto the animals before they are slain for you. And there's one thing the Bible teaches, that even though the animals become the carriers of your sins away from you, the animals themselves were not sinful. In fact, to the contrary, the animals were most holy. That is what God said. To the contrary, the animals were most holy. Therefore, the best way to understand what the Bible means in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, is to perhaps go beyond the obvious. Go to the writings of the book of the Hebrews themselves. Not just the translation in the KJV or NIV or any of the Bible. And for this purpose, I'm making available to you the translation that you have in the complete Jewish Bible for 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So that you see that what is written there is that Christ, who knew no sin, was made not sin. You must mind that language. Christ was not made sin. Christ was made the sin offering. They believe the teaching of Christianity, which is the teaching of the Bible, is the law of, of imputation. Your sin is imputed in Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed in you. The Bible never teaches that Christ became sin. As you are going to hear from the mouth of Mr. Akani and his followers, the Bible teaches that Christ became sin of rain. Sin and sin of rain. I do, you do not need me to tell you that they are not the same. And you cannot believe them to be the same and say that you are a Christian. Christ became sin of rain. Never sin itself. To become Eh? Thank God. Stand up, stand up. Repeat it so that they can hear you. 
to, to become an embodiment of sin. What an achievement. As you can see that I wrote there. Mr. Canis Christ was no longer the Holy One of Israel. The sinless Son of God. But the embodiment. The embodiment of sin. Mr. Akani had transformed the Son of God into Satan. That is what he has. That is what he's saying with his mouth. Mr. Akani had transformed the word the, the Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, into Satan. And some people are repeating it before him as Christianity. Do you remember that Jesus had said earlier, it's a sacrifices and burnt offerings that would us not, but a body. God created a body for him. For that time, until that time, he carried inside of that body a life light. So God is saying now, friend, are you interested in saving these souls? This is the cup. Containing what? <laughs> the iniquity of each one of them. My own iniquity is in here. Your own Mr. Flesh is in here. And so God presented to him. He looked at that cup the first time. He said, Father, take away this cup from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, O oh God. If there's no other way, let your will be done. He stood up again. He went and looked for his disciples. Can't you pray with me for one hour? They were all snoring. They couldn't participate here. If any of them was alive to pray that time, it would have meant that our salvation would have been possible with the support of prayer or some prayer warriors. They couldn't. They themselves were carrying Mr. Iniquity. He came back and said, Father, is there no other way? He said, well, if you want to do your will, I won't force it on you. But if you want to save these souls, this is the cup. I want you to see that Jesus took that cup. He who knew no sin. And like this, Bitter. He drank the cup. Listen, from that moment, even his father couldn't look at him again. He said, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? No answer. He became the embodiment of sin. Christ gulped down the way you will gulp down molten cement. If you are suicidal, the way you will gulp down molten iron Christ gulped down the sin of the world and 
he became the embodiment of sin. Uh, that is what Mr. Bilakan is teaching. Christ became the embodiment of sin. Some people might ask the question that this issue of Mr. Aguilar is a wrong teaching is being tackled by me because uh, I have access to better interpretations of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I want to tell you that is not necessarily true. No, that is not true. If you are a true believer in Christ, what comes to your mind when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is not that Christ became the embodiment of sin. The teaching that Christ became the embodiment of sin, let me warn you, you have to be taught that, you have to be told that, that teaching. From simply reading the Bible, you do not get that. You might not understand the real meaning of what you are reading on the face of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, but it will never come to you that Christ, in actual fact, became the embodiment of sin, that Christ became Satan, which Mr. Aguilar is teaching. Except, except you are reading the Bible, you are reading that passage of the Bible in isolation, except you have never read the book of Exodus, Except you have never read the book of Leviticus. Except you have never read passages in the Old Testament where the idea of the scapegoat was treated in full. So for anyone who has read where God introduced the doctrine of the Lamb standing in for the sin of a sinner no, it will not get to you. What it what will get to you is that the sin of rain is most holy. What Mr. Akani is remonstrating on is not the teaching of the Bible. It's the teaching of the occult introduced into the Bible. If I must say it a millionth time. True Pentecostalism, true word of faith. Saying that Christ ceased from being the Holy One to being Satan, you are talking of another Christ. You are, talk you are talking of a distorted Christ. Mr. Agbile Akani, as I said, I really pity him. And I pity those that are deceived by him. If there's anything that is godly in Pentecostalism, Mr. Biliakani should exemplify it. But you can see him totally distorting the character of the sons of, of the Son of God. We will just listen to a few clips, then I close this video. Here was Jesus that they wanted to arrest him before somebody did the sound like this, and they couldn't catch him. But now, they slapped him, and their hand didn't cut. Listen carefully to what Mr. Agane is saying. They slapped Christ. Their, their hand didn't cut not because Christ willingly offered himself as he testified in the book of John, willingly laid down his life as offering for sin. 
But according to Mr. Akani, but because he was now a helpless, weak sinner, embodiment of sin. They spat on him. They spat on him and the mouth of that man didn't didn't tear apart. How would the mouth of this Peter? How will his mouth have uh, uh, torn apart? How would that have, well, how would that have happened? Since Christ was now a weak, helpless, and hapless sinner. Yeah, that is what Mr. Kulia can is teaching. Not that Christ willingly by himself lay down his life, but that he was now a helpless, weak, and hapless sinner. When Elijah, when somebody said, and the king said, I say, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down. Fire burned those ones alive. Moses said, if I'm the man of God, let these people die now. Let the ground. And it happened. But this man. The weak, helpless, and hapless Christ was surely now far weaker. Than Elijah. Definitely far weaker than Moses. Uh, as we generally say in my house, quoting Wale Shonika, we are now seeing the metamorphosis of Christ. Mr. Akanis Christ had totally metamorphosized into a weak, helpless, and hapless sinner. The Christ of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, no longer assisted at least for once Moses and Elijah were far more powerful at this stage we were no longer talking about God the son we are now talking about a creature of Satan we are talking now about the embodiment of sin. They pushed him here. They pushed him there. Because. Yeah. Because. Because of what? He has drunk something. What has he drunk? The iniquity of who? me my own iniquity and so they were pushing him like this 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 everybody was wondering what has happened to this man who opened the eyes of the blind who spoke and lazarus came alive what has happened to this man whom we tried to push down the other time and we didn't know how he disappeared. What has happened to this man? If he is the son of the living God, how could this thing happen to him? They were all wondering how Christ became this, this helpless. How Christ became this weak. Yeah. According to Mr. Akane. And they pushed him from judgment 
to judgment. He will come here, talk. He kept quiet. And they took him. And they nailed him. He became the stubborn, the rebellious, the gluten, the drunkard, the liar, the fornicator, the adulterer that cannot be tamed. Has the Messiah been more slandered by someone? who supposedly represents him that, than what you have just heard? I don't know. I don't know. And as you can see, therefore, what you have when you go to the true Christian faith that is www.thetruechristianfaith.com when you go to the first page of that website you, you see there is a question there which is the basis of actually everything which Jesus is this please which Jesus are these people talking about? It's always important that we know exactly the difference between what the Bible teaches and what our men of God, what they teach. Men of God, in fact, I come out open and close so that we know exactly who we are following, who we are worshipping. Me more, me more, me more. Oh, Lord, do marry. Ni kutu kutu. Ni wo wo ni wa. Me more, me more, me more. Oh, ni ya nu ju lo. Oh, lo go meta lai o lo buku. Mi mo mi mo mi mo. A mo ti oru ni. O fi a de wura o le le yi teka. Que o bem a serafim, o leni o ajure, o tu ti wa tu si wa ti ti lai. Mi mo mi mo mi mo, bo kun kun pa o mo. Be o ju e le she ko le ri o go re. I wo ni kan lo mo. Ko ton se e lo mi. Be pe no a gbara ti ne fe. Mi mo mi mo mi mo. O Lodo Mare, O Boy Shereni Le Loke Lo Nyo, Mi Mo Mi Mo Mi Mo, O Ni Yo Nu Ju Lo, O Logo Meta La 